Okay, yeah. can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me is the first thing you always hear Stephen Hawking say. Can you hear me? Very important. Okay, um, we're running a little bit late, so um, I've timed this at 40 minutes, so I'm going to cut one bit at the end. I think you'll be begging for mercy by that stage anyway. What I wanted to talk about, we thought, in, given the year that's in it, and the tragic delay during the last year, nice time to renew the ideas on what, what is going on in CERN, what, what is the famous experiment all about. You might have heard of the search for the god particle, as science journalists love to, love to call it. And it is an extremely exciting experiment. And what I really want to show you is it's more than about a search for one particle, much, much more than that. <laughs> OK, so I have two pictures there to get started with. And the first one is of Einstein. You can't move in this area of, of, of physics without Einstein. Um, it's often forgotten in a, in a talk in particle physics to begin with. It all comes down to one equation don't have a blackboard, but you all know it, E is mc squared. In particle physics, and that reminds me, it doesn't, it doesn't come down to, as I've heard even a Cambridge philosopher say, it's not about dropping your watch on the floor and looking at the bits inside the watch. That, that is not what it's about. It's much more exciting uh, than that. What happens is, is the incredible energy density of these experiments. Out of that energy density, you can create whole new particles. So whole new particles come into existence that weren't inside the thing you were looking at at the time. And we look at the de decay products of those, and that's how we, we identify what was there. So it's an extremely exciting thing. The other thing I, I hope to convince you is it's also not about particles anyway. What particle physics in the modern world is now about is it's about we know there are four fundamental forces in the universe around us. The tremendously exciting discovery of la the last century was that at least two of those forces are very deeply connected. In, an, in, an, in, 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 in a way, they're actually the same force. They're, they're, they really are two faces of the same coin. And since then, the big search has been to see, can we tie in the third force? That's grand unified theory. And maybe even tie in the fourth force. And that's the famous theory of everything, that all the four forces of the universe that are known will only be one force. Now, the reason I mention Einstein there is actually Einstein was the first person to start, start that. And in every magazine article you see in Einstein, even nowadays, you'll see somebody saying, and then he went off on a quest for the unification of forces, which was unsuccessful. And they sort of forget to mention that actually everybody else has been on that quest ever since. <laughs> I mean, that started a movement that has been going ever since. And one day, I think we may be successful. So anyway, that's why Einstein is, is there. The other thing I want to mention is Ernest Walton. By the way, it might be hard to see here. Just pray. It works if you pray. Yeah. I think Ernest Walton is very, very important because from the experimental point of view, you could argue that he's actually the grandfather of particle physics because he was involved in, in the setting up and use of the very first accelerator. And in fact, you know, as an Irish person, I've looked into this quite a lot. And we would argue that, of course, it's known as a Cockroft Walton tube. But Walton did a great deal of the work. He really did. And it's no coincidence that he was the man who actually pushed the button. Well, uh, Cockroft was like the manager, and they were both running on, uh, working under Rutherford. But Walton really was hugely involved in the construction of, of that mu <coughs> voltage multiplier, et cetera, et cetera. And all accelerators that have been used since then, including the giant, <laughs> the giant one at CERN, are basically based on that idea, as we'll see. OK, so let's move on. Quick, um, quick look at what we're going to do. OK, so uh, <laughs> three bits. It's a bit intimidating. First, I'm going to talk very quickly about the LHC. What is it? Why the hell would anybody want to build it? And how does it actually work? Then I'm afraid we'll have to do a little bit of work. A brief history of particles from Walton to the standard model. I promise I'll try and keep it short. <coughs> and then I'll go into what we expect to see at the LHC. First of all, in terms of the Higgs boson, the famous party you've heard about. Then, even more exciting, the stuff about what we, what we may see, which is beyond the standard model. And of course, that's what the sort of today's generation really expect, that we know the standard model is incomplete anyway. So what we see beyond. And then, something related to my own field, I can't help pointing out that you know, there's a huge link here with cosmology as well. For all physics students, teachers, and professional researchers, what's fantastic about the era in which we're living is you get this amazing convergence between particle physics, the physics of the incredibly small, and cosmology. You didn't have that 30 years ago, whereas now they're coming very, very close together. And one reason is for that is, of course, that the energy densities that they're using in accelerators are beginning to come closer and closer to you know, the sort of energy you were talking about shortly after the Big Bang. So it's a really fantastic convergence of, a convergence of two different fields. Very, very exciting stuff. OK, we'd better get on. That's a lot of, it's pretty much all of modern physics to do before lunch. <laughs> so let's look at it first. There's a the famous thing. You know all about it. Um, High energy proton beams. 
Why protons? Because they're very easy to produce. It's just hydrogen ions. So high energy proton beams smack into each other, as every boy racer knows. Head on collision, you definitely die because the energy is, is twice the energy of a particular of one particular car, so it's, you know, as opposed to banging into a wall, head-on collision is much more efficient. Huge energy density, as we'll see from the figures, I want to show you a few figures. It doesn't seem that much when you look at the energy itself, and that's, that's that whole thing about black holes. I, I blame physicists like myself for saying biggest energy since this Big Bang. Of course, it's really the energy density. The actual energy itself is, is very small, but you and me. But you and me are very large. If you're a proton and an electron, that sort of energy is absolutely enormous. It's the energy density that really counts. Anyway, like I say, what that creates, out of that energy, we can create incredibly small, um, short-lived particles. And that's, that's the key, that we actually create these particles, which are not in existence before that happens. And then, of course, you're into the whole business of detection and measurement. And no, there will not be any giant black holes. There is this theoretical idea of mini black holes, which is a very different thing. But a mini black hole is really almost no relation to a black hole. And I don't want to get into that. It's just it's one of these stories that just ran and ran that makes no sense. We'll come back to it at the end if there's time, question time. OK, why would you want to do it? I, I always think these, these are the, this is the interesting stuff. Why would you want to do it? Well, everybody knows the first part. Explore the fundamental structure of matter, as in what's inside the nucleus. OK, the proton, what's inside the proton? OK, the quark, is there something inside the quark? Blah, blah, blah. What's the fundamental structure? Nowadays, that gets rephrased as investigate the interrelation of forces that hold matter together because the, the, the forces that hold matter together are intimately connected with matter itself, and that's really how you look at it as a whole package. The second thing, of course, like I say, is the convergence <laughs> thing of we also, at the same time, can study conditions that really pertain to the early stages of the universe. That, that's exactly what you're looking at, because we haven't seen energy conditions like that since then. That means we can test cosmological theory. Now, I'm giving you some figures there. It turns out when you do the math, as the, the, the oh, actually, I got 10 to the 18, but uh, the temperatures you're talking about when I give you the, the beam things, the temperatures would correspond to about 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19 Kelvin. That corresponds to the universe at one billionth of a second. In other words, one billionth of a second of the Big Bang. So that, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the conditions and the sort of particles that existed one billionth of a second after Big Bang. The volume of the universe at that stage would have been about a football. Now, how they work that out is actually quite complicated. You have to use general relativity. So we'll just take that on board. Um, like I say, high, highest energy density since Big Bang. Um, I can't resist throwing in two things. There are two things in particular we want to know from a cosmological point of view. The first one is this business of dark matter. You've all heard about it. Astronomers think it's hilarious that cosmologists go on and on about matter that not only can you not see it through a telescope, you will never be able to see it through a telescope. So they keep asking, well, how do you know it's there? And cosmologists answer back and say, well, look, you know, matter to us is something that has a gravitational effect. You know, if I'm heavy, you will go around me. It's nothing to do with whether I can see you. In other words, we don't demand of matter that it should interact with the electromagnetic force. We just say, it interacts with the gravitational force. And that's why, to a cosmologist, it's perfectly reasonable that you know, it's actually almost 70% of the matter of the universe would actually be in the form of dark, dark matter. The way I would look at it is we can't rule it out. You couldn't say it's not. It's perfectly possible the matter would be of that form. Now, what we don't know is, well, what sort of particle would that be? It's called a WIMP, a weakly interacting Massive particle, weakly interacting mass, mass particle, thank you. Um, you know, we've no idea what the nature of that particle is, and that's, that's one of the things that might turn up in CERN. The other thing is the good old mystery of antimatter. What is the story with antimatter, anyway?